turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, we're going to begin reading in verse 33, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leaven. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, reveal to us your secrets. Teach us, Father, those things that you would have us to know. Help us, Father, to apply them to our lives, apply them to our church, and to walk worthy of you, to please you, not to please man and to glorify your name. We ask these things in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Another parable, Jesus spake unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. That's real short. Uh, and it's uh, probably the most controversial of all these kingdom parables in this chapter. This is a fourth of the parables found in the, uh, Matthew chapter 13. Remember that Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven on earth. On earth. We're not talking about the kingdom of heaven in heaven. The kingdom of heaven in heaven is perfect. It's, it's complete. There's no, no problems. And he's not talking about the kingdom of heaven that will come down to earth. Uh, after the millennium, after Satan is finally destroyed, after all evil is purged from the kingdom, then we'll have a perfect kingdom and not have any kind of controversy. There are three elements in this parable. We have the leaven, a woman, and three measures of meal. But we also have two actions. The woman hid the leaven in the meal, and the leaven takes over the entire three measures of meal. It, it consumes it. To understand this parable, we must remember that Jesus is talking to the Jews, and the elements of this story would have been have special meaning to them. We look at it from the point of Gentiles, we look at it from the point of view as Christians even, we miss some things that they would have saw, uh, seen, and we uh, need to see as well. So let's look at this parable through those that heard it for the first time. How would they have heard it? Now look, uh, now we'll be at the first element of the parable, the leaven. Leaven is yeast. Now, I don't know too much about yeast, except that I remember that in college we took and had yeast under the microscope and we'd watch it uh, sput out and, and multiply and, and everything. It didn't take long. It multiplied very fast. And it uh, uh, looked kind of weird. It wasn't like a normal, uh, like a cell from a plant or a cell from a, a, an animal. It looked different. Uh, it's uh, uh, more related to fungus than anything else. But uh, I remember seeing that. Most women are familiar with, with uh, yeast. Uh, in this parable, uh, a rest of the property of the yeast to ferment and to fill the flour to take it over. And if you've made sourdough bread, or made any kind of bread that, that rises, you have to have some kind of rising agent. And uh, good bread is usually made with yeast. Uh, I uh, uh, found out several years ago, uh, uh, I like sourdough bread, sourdough biscuit, sourdough bread. It has a special flavor to it, probably because it had the 
uh, increased amount of alcohol in it. It just burns off and it leaves the flavor behind. But uh, it has a special flavor and I like it. Uh, uh, and if you've made sourdough bread, you know you have to have a starter, a sourdough starter. Uh, yeast is found out through all nature. It's out there. You know, uh, you can take and, and take uh, flour and water uh, and just uh, leave it, uh, mix it, and leave it exposed. It's going to have yeast spores that land on it from the air, and it will, act over a period of time, it will self-start. But the best way is just to have a starter. And I found out years ago that the pioneers going through the country and everything found uh, that they could take uh, juniper berries from, we call them cedar trees, but they're actually juniper trees, and they take these juniper berries, and uh, they're blue, uh, bluish, I should say, and have a white coating on the outside. That white coating is yeast, and so they make their starter from these juniper berries, just mix, mix it with a uh, <coughs> with dough, and it would start everything up. And then they would keep the starter and move it, tear it with them. But I'm sure something similar to this happened with the Jewish people. They probably used uh, uh, what was common to them, which was grapes. Uh, they would take the grapes. If you ever see a natural grape, it has seems to have a. Uh, did you have muscadines from that grows in the south, and we have muscadine grapes all over the countryside. And there is a that white coating that's on the grape, and that white coating is is yeast. And they probably took the grape skins and used them to cause the fermentation process to take place in their their uh, dough and to begin, uh, uh, and they'd have a starter, which they would call their leaven, and they would keep it from, from batch to batch to batch. Uh, I don't remember, that I, I was reading, and they, they said that for a woman would, uh, would make uh, about five or six loaves of bread a day. They weren't great big loaves, you understand? They wouldn't be smaller. <clears throat> and the leaven, of course, makes the bread bubble up and uh, I've never done this so I'm going by what I've observed uh, you know you, you mix the leaven you you roll it you, you do it all that and put it over into a, a, a warm spot in the kitchen and you cover it with a, a um, towel and it just sits there and it just grows and it, it grows and you take and take a piece of that and you, you can make your biscuits or your your uh, uh, bread from that and so that's what the women did and throughout most of the year the Jewish women would use that kind of bread and uh, to make their uh, to for their family because it, it had a flavor uh, I think because it really does it's more appealing than unleavened bread unleavened bread would be like trying to eat uh, crackers or uh, not even, it's not even related to tortillas. It's just, uh, it's doughy and it's, uh, Flour and water. Yeah, it's basically flour and water and, and it, it doesn't have a lot of, of uh, uh, it doesn't have the same consistency as what we call light bread. Uh, and uh, the yeast, though, breaks down the gluten in the flour and produces carbon dioxide and alcohol. That white substance on the grapes uh, skins, when they crush the grapes in, in a natural setting, it's going to do one thing. It's going to start fermenting that uh, grape juice. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, after the prohibition, uh, or when prohibition started, is when uh, Welch's grape juice got started. He developed a process that would stop the fermentation uh, of the grape juice, and they could put it in jars and, uh, or bottles. And you know, we use that in our um, in our Lord's Supper uh, instead of using fermented wine. But anything in the past, prior to that, if you had grape juice, it's just a matter of hours before it begins to produce alcohol 
uh, and, it, and uh, it, it's no longer uh, non-alcoholic, it's going to have some kind of alcohol content. Leavened bread is easily identified because it has holes in the texture of the bread that is absent in bread without leavening. Um, back home, we were raised up with Mrs. Baird's bread. And Mrs. Baird's bread's selling point was it didn't have the big holes in it. I mean, your, your peanut butter and jelly stayed inside the bread. It was, I don't know how they, they blended the, the bread in such a way that it had smaller holes and had a, a smooth texture to it. And even then, uh, then sometimes you'd get a, a slice of bread and have a great big old hole in it. You ever done that? And so, uh, but uh, leavened bread uh, is identified because it has the, these holes. That's from that fermentation process, carbon dioxide being produced, expands, and all that. And, uh, but it's absent in the bread that's without leaven. Jesus said, a woman took leaven and hid it. Now, that's an important thing. She hid it in three measures of flour. Now, this would be very common sight to uh, almost everyone that uh, heard this parable. Husbands and children would, would have the knowledge of mom, the baker in the house, going to all the trouble to put yeast inside of the dough so that the yeast could cause that fermentation process to begin and to expand that bread and, and to make the common everyday bread, what we would call light bread. And you can tell the difference between light bread and heavy bread. All you have to do is, if you've ever had any um, le uh, unleavened bread, it's uh, chewy and it's uh, uh, sometimes it's hard. Uh, I was doing some research. They actually there actually is a, a unleavened bread that they fry in a pan that does is not hard. It's uh, more malleable and you you can break it off and everything up a little easier than. Uh, but the the when I think of uh, the leavened bread that uh, most of them had, uh, it, I think of the of uh, hardtack that the pioneers used. It was a staple you could have because it would not corrupt. And so, but if you have light bread, you know, if you leave it long enough, it's going to mold. And we've all had experienced that, I'm sure. In the Jewish home, the wife would spend much of her time preparing and making bread. Every child would have this memory of their mother doing that very job. But as the Jews would, would uh, also hear things that were very familiar from their history. Three measures of meal. Why did Jesus say three measures of meal? Well, if you go back to Genesis chapter 18, when the three strangers who turned out about to be two angels and the Lord God Almighty came to to Abraham as they were going to go to Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. Abraham invited them to sit down and to have a meal and he went and told Sarah to take three measures of meal and bake bread. Well, if you take, you're making bread right then, what happens? It's not going to be leavened because it doesn't have the time to, to, uh, to get large. I, I read in one uh, case, one commentator was saying this amount of meal, uh, in this case, Jesus talked about putting leaven to it, would make about 60 loaves of bread. That is a lot of bread. That's a big family. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. They may be mistaken, but it did, uh, did make a quite a bit of bread. Somebody said it, it was uh, bread enough for a feast. Uh, which is, uh, I think, was probably a, a more accurate way of describing it. Uh, and so they would t think of Genesis chapter 18, and Abraham entertaining the three strangers. And there, he told it, quickly make three, take, uh, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. And that's more like what we would see in un a, a, with unleavened bread. And hearing this parable, they would have thought of Abraham's fellowship with the Lord God. And, uh, and that's really, I think, what we're looking at here. 
we're looking at something else. Many identify the yeast leaven with the gospel spread into the world because, it, as they would say, it permeates and it expands and it's uncontrollable. It, it just goes on and it occupies all, all the world. And the problem with this interpretation is that uh, leaven is almost always associated with sin. Almost always. In fact, if in this case that is the interpretation, uh, then out of all the verses about leaven, we only have five that present uh, uh, leaven as, in a positive light. And three of them are the, two, uh, the three verses that uh, have this parable. The one here in, in Matthew chapter 13, verse uh, 33, and Luke chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. And there's, then there's two verses in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 17, and Amos chapter 4, verse 5, which have to do with Thanksgiving offering at the Feast of First Fruits. And it was an offering that was not burdened in the fire. It was not an offering given up to God. It was an offering presented, but it was meant for the, the priest to eat. And it was not something that uh, uh, was meant to uh, worship God with because the command is given not to have any leaven with uh, his, his sacrifice. And so we, we can see that from Scripture. And so I, I lean toward this not being about the spread of the gospel. Evil. The Bible says that evil men will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul said that to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. Think about leaven. Leaven consumes, it ferments, it puffs up. Leaven breaks up. Uh, uh, leaven bread uh, easily spoils, and it, but it's not so with unleavened bread. So putting the leaven there, I think Jesus is talking about something that's sinful. In fact, Jesus warned his disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we don't have to uh, even study hard to find out that the leaven of the Pharisees is his hypocrisy. And that what do you hear from people who are lost about the church? Well, I don't want to go to the church because of all those hypocrites. Well, if they look around, there's hypocrites everywhere. And they probably are hypocrites themselves. I look at a person who says, I have this standard in my life. Now, I'm not talking about obeying anything of God's, but I have this standard in my life where they break their own standard. If they say, I do, I, I, I do this, I hate lying, I will never lie. If they ever tell a lie, then they're already a hypocrite because they have taken a stand that they hate lying. And so this is the hypocrisy. Luke chapter 12, verse 1, uh, associated with uh, 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 the Pharisees, is the leaven of hypocrisy. And then the leaven of the Sadducees is the denial of the spiritual, of the Holy Spirit, and uh, of life beyond the body. Living for the hearing now, but uh, a, uh, a rationalism that uh, what I can see and I can taste and I can touch, that is real. Anything beyond that is, is not real and not something for me. They were the liberals in the Jewish church of that day, in the Jewish community. Uh, and they, uh, the sad thing about it is most of the priests were members of the Sadducee party. And so they didn't believe in all that the scriptures teach about uh, the life uh, of God and the life with God after death. Jesus also warned against the leaven of Herod and of the Herodians, and this is materialism. And uh, he didn't want them to get involved with that. He warned his disciples against it. And Paul warned against the leaven of immorality, which we read earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that... Uh, and it, uh, the leaven of legalism is what he warned the Galatians about. And 
when it comes to evil, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And it, all it takes is a very little bit and it begins to spread. <coughs> Throughout all, one of the things that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the idea that, that this is the, the spread of the church or the spread of the gospel throughout the world uh, is it, this what this leaven is all about it, is that it's an amillennial view it's a view a view or not amillennial a, a post millennial view things are going to get better and better and better and Jesus is going to come into power because uh, the whole world will turn themselves over to him that's not what you read in scripture if you read Revelation Jesus has to, to do it. It has to destroy his enemies. The millennial kingdom is there in Revelation in, in that one chapter. And at the end of the chapter, Satan is set loose and he has to destroy him and his followers all over again. Until that happens, there is always leaven, sin, in the, in the camp. And we have to see that. Christianity and all the churches are infected with leaven. Today, it's, it's obvious. And uh, some of it is, is so, we don't think about it, so innocuous that we don't even think about it. Uh, sin, hypocrisy, materialism, rationalism, legalism, entertainmentism. You go to some churches and that's how <clears throat> they exist. I've got the best show in town. And uh, especially in directing uh, ministries toward young people, you got the gym and you've got the parties and you've got the trips and all this. And that seems to be the focus of the church is to make a big party and uh, to be entertaining. Uh, and sometimes we all fall into these traps. Uh, I remember one church uh, near where we live, the pastor uh, and entice, to entice his people, people to invite more people to church said if we get so and so, uh, such and such in our church on such and such Sunday then I will preach from the rooftop it made the papers because sure enough they got enough people there he had to climb up to the top of the roof and from the, the, uh, from the roof he preached the Bible and he's a good man a godly man but these are some of the things that <clears throat> infiltrate into our church in their 11. So what's needed? One thing is that Jesus warned, he said, beware of the leaven of, and he would warn against that. And so we need to be aware of it and its influence. We should not just be ignorant of Satan's devices. We should be aware that leaven is there and it will enter into our churches. Secondly, we need to purge it from among us. And I think we can use the example of the Jews <coughs> during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Passover season. They, uh, to this day, and it's, they've made a game out of it with the kids because they would take a little bit of yeast, a little bit of leaven, and they would hide it in the house. And it would, the little children would go all through the house hunting for that last piece of leaven. And they could not have Passover until they got the leaven out of the house. I think that's a good idea. We have to understand, we can't have true fellowship with the Lord God and our Savior until we get the leaven out of us. And, and out of our churches, out of our own lives, we have to get it out. And so we need to do that. We need to take and purge ourselves uh, whether it's in our hearts or our families or in our churches, we have to get those things out. And what's so hard is, is that we have a hard time identifying it. Which means we have to be careful. We have to take time of prayer and fasting and let God show us. But Paul said it in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. How can this story be talking about the church if the church is to be unleavened? Because it's leavened when you put the yeast there. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 
Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Being real, that's what sincerity is about, and truth. A hypocrite is not sincere. A hypocrite is not real. He's fake. And truth. We have that, that responsibility to be unleavened bread of sincerity and truth in our daily life. We need people to see that we are real. I was listening to a gentleman I've listened to several times before, and I really fell under conviction. We actually, we don't act like Christians, just to be blunt. We don't think about our actions and we don't act in a Christian way toward other people. For the lost, in particular, many times even toward each other, we're not very loving and kind. And I think it's time that we look at ourselves. We all want revival, but I think we don't want to take the steps to have revival take place. We say we want to do certain things, but we don't step out and do those things. And I think it's time for we who are Christians to examine ourselves to uh, be able to actually get the leaven of sin out of our lives. And uh, the, as he says here, malice and wickedness, we get that out of our lives and allow God to really work in our lives as we want him to. And uh, if we'll do that, we will be fit for the use of the, of the kingdom. And let me say this, in the Jewish uh, Passover season, in the Old Testament, I'm not talking about modern day, but in the Old Testament, if a person ate leavened bread during that Passover week, the Bible says they were to be cut off from the people. They were not to be considered as members of the, the Jewish family because of what they did. And then we think, well, that's such a minor thing. You know, eat a biscuit and, and you're, you're cut off? It's serious. God intends us to be pure people. And that example in the Old Testament shows how serious God is about it. And I think we have to get serious about it too. And as far as those who are our loved ones who are not saved, we have a responsibility to walk the walk and to talk the talk. To speak with our lips and live it out in our lives. And it may be the reason so many of our loved ones are not coming to faith in Jesus. Because they don't see any difference. Why should I put my faith in Jesus if you're living just like I am? They'll tell you and I hear it all the time, well, I'm a good person. I don't need church, and they don't, because I, I'm a good person. I can be just as good a person as you are outside of the church as you are inside of the church. In fact, I might even be a little bit better. And if we're honest, it could be true. They don't need the church. What do they need? They need Jesus, who will transform their, their lives and they'll be counted unleavened toward him because of what he has done to transform their lives. And that's what we hope for. Amen?